All right. Here we are, just about ready to start. <clears throat> I'm waiting for the uh, clock to strike one here on the U.S. East Coast. <laughs> we have a bunch of people joining joining the room as we speak. All right. Well, welcome everyone to the uh, second week of the um, 2024 Soil and Nutrition Conference. We are very excited to be hosting uh, Ken Hamilton today. We'll be talking about animal production. Um, really looking deeply at animal health, animal welfare, uh, cost of production, um, traditional principles and practices. Uh, he's going to be starting with um, an explanation of human health as it connects to how our fat consumption has changed over the last 100, 150 years, um, and then getting into some brilliant work that he's been doing for a couple of decades now. I was first introduced to his work through um, an elder from the Acres world, Jerry Bonetti, a brilliant, brilliant man, a founder of Agrodynamics, one of our sponsors for this year's conference. Um, um, and uh, and most recently reconnected to him directly through through Vale Dixon, one of our long-term uh, BFA board members, and uh, she runs Civil Soil Solutions, another one of our sponsors. But just Ken's been doing brilliant work and um, I think the implications uh, are, are just stupendous. So we'll get through the background, the science, the connections to human health and epidemiology, and then into his, his cutting edge work um, and begin the panel in about an hour and then um, take Q&A for the half hour after that half hour. So please feel free to introduce yourselves uh, in the chat and communicate uh, between each other. If you've got questions that you'd like to be addressed by the panel or uh, the speaker, please put those in the Q&A section. All right. I think that's good. You ready to take it away, Ken? <clears throat> you need to uh, unmute and turn your camera on, Ken. Okay, we there we go. We are now in and we're ready to go. Sure. Take it away. <laughs> hey, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Okay, and share. Okay, thank you, Dan. As Dan mentioned, I ran across Jerry Bernetti's work probably 12 years ago and was absolutely thrilled with the concept of the health and nutrition, inflammation and all those kind of things. And so for a long time, I read and studied his work and was privileged to speak with Jerry briefly a few times before he passed away. And so this is a continuation of his work. And so Jerry, we, we're here with you and we know you're here, so let's move forward. This is the concept of what's changed in our food and how it affects our health. And so we have are preparing a series of educational videos It's called Food for Life. This is one of the primary videos. There's probably a dozen of these coming, but this is the this is the basis and the foundational work that Jerry started that we're continuing. And so um, with that, we'll we'll move forward. Four major shifts in the American diet have occurred in the last 150 years. The two major shifts affected our fats and our carbohydrates. In the fat section, seed oils replaced saturated animal fats, along with hydrogenated seed oils, Crisco and margarine. Our carbohydrates were refined. We replaced whole flour with refined flours and we had a massive increase in sugar consumption. So. These are major shifts. And as we look at our ancestral diets, we basically had about a 96% whole food with saturated animal fats with approximately 4% or less of sugar. Our modern diets now have completely altered that landscape to where real food is less than 30%. Our vegetable oils are now up to 32% the main driver of our metabolic dysfunction. 
sugar has escalated up to about 21% and refined carbohydrates, refined wheat flour up to 17%. And so seed oils are more dangerous than refined carbohydrates. And we're going to explain why. When you look back at history, you have this, this shift from infectious diseases into degenerative diseases that didn't exist before. So we went from pneumonias and influenzas, tuberculosis and gastrointestinal infections and heart valvular disease as being the primary killer of mankind now into heart disease, cancer, drugs, medical uh, symptomologies. You go into respiratory systems and then into neurological uh, cerebrovascular diseases. So there's been a massive shift in what is killing mankind. And the importance here is our cells all function. And the, the primary focus of this is on our metabolic health. And we have to protect that cellular operation. And so our cells are doing so many things and the massive responsibility of that cell is signaling molecules and cell response. This is the massive system of communication. And this is what we need to protect because it's not only function, but it's communication. And it's oxidative damage is the primary factor in damaging our cells where inflammation causes or needs this corrective response. When we go back through history, we're looking at when things changed. And so from a historical perspective until 1850 is when we begin the alterations in our food systems. We began processing food. In 1866, we began putting in cottonseed oil. In the 1870s, we went from roller mill to, from stone mill to roller mills, which meant that we eliminated the bran and the germ in our whole flours when we went to the refined flours. We started processing margarine into animal fats and seed oils in, in the 1870s as well. By 1880, we had vegetable and seed oils into the food chain, 1911 Crisco. And then with, in the 1940s, margarines from seed oils. Later on, 1957, high fructose corn syrup. And then we had the government get involved in the US dietary guidelines. And by 2019, about 63% of the US diet was processed food, a major shift from whole foods. And as this occurred, disease shifted from infectious to degenerative. So you take a period of almost 6,000 years of humankind we have destroyed our metabolic health in less than 100 years. And this is what it looks like. You can take the US population in the 1850s, 1900s, 1950s, and 2000s, and let's take a closer look at what has happened to our metabolic health with this change in our food systems. Genetics has not changed in the last 100 years. For thousands of years, there's been little to no degenerative diseases. So as we look at this now, at an approximate population of just over 336 million, actually now we're post closer to 340 million people, you have more than 90% of our US population is metabolically unhealthy. It's pushing 94%. 73% are overweight. You have 60% have at least one metabolic syndrome. And there are probably 75 to 80 metabolic syndromes now that we didn't have 100 years ago. 50% have high blood pressure. 48% of our population has some form of cardiovascular disease. You have 48 or 46% that are pre-diabetic. Nearly 45% have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And we have 43% obesity. It's almost 150 million Americans. 40% or more have multiple metabolic syndromes. 
18% are medically severely obese. You have a 12% or higher diabetic population. You have depression of nearly 27 million people and a quarter of our entire population, over 110 million are on psychiatric drugs. You have 5% with cancer. So this is a massive, massive shift in health and what's causing degenerative diseases. So you look at cardiovascular, we're losing just under a million people a year to that. Cancer, over five, 600,000 per year. Obesity, Alzheimer's, diabetes, and liver disease, and so on. So you go back in a timeline and you start looking at how have things changed? Well, in Boston, you go back to 1811. There were no heart attacks or deaths. Uh, they just, it was virtually 2.6%. Okay, by the turn of the 19th century, there were eight worldwide reports of myocardial infraction or heart attacks. By uh, 1897, there were six recorded cases of angina, which is your heart not receiving enough oxygen-rich blood, so you've got pain. The first recorded heart attack in the United States was 1912. By 1930, heart attacks, heart disease, cardio or coronary heart disease became the leading cause of death. And by 2010, 32% of the deaths were related to heart disease. I just want to interrupt if I can for one second, Ken. Yes. I, I know you've got a lot of slides and everybody's going to be able to watch this recording and see these slides. We really want to make sure we get to the exciting part you've got for agronomy. So very good. I can just ask that, you know, you don't need to read every single line here. Just uh, <laughs> okay. you got, you're brilliantly, you know, explaining what's been what's been occurring. But we've only got an hour for this presentation. So. So in cancer timeline, we go from 188 deaths around the 1800s to one in three. That's a massive increase. When you look at the U.S. diabetic population in 1890, 2.8 per 100,000, this is what it looked like. You have this little teeny dot somewhere in Kansas. Okay, now, this is what it looks like. 34 million diabetics in the US. That's a 4,600% increase. And when you add the pre-diabetics to it, you have over 51% of the population that is affected by metabolic syndrome. So you go back and you look at our change in our food and our consumption. So where do you lay the blame? You can't put it on butter. You can't put it on lard. You can't put it on margarine. So look at the incline in vegetable oil from the 1900s into 2009. You go through consumption. So in the 1865, before all this started, less than 1% of our calories are 2.2 grams a day. You look at us now, we're at 80 plus grams a day, over 30% of our calories. And the adipose tissue, in 1959, we were as high as 9.1. Today, we're in excess of 25% of the omega-6 linoleic acid in our adipose tissue. And so you can see this massive shift where we've gone from natural, saturated, stable animal fats into highly oxidative vegetable oils. And these are the consequences. So you go into obesity timeline, 19th century, 1%. Now we're up to 43% in our obesity. So again, you go back and you track the vegetable oils with the obesity charts. And you can see the direct correlation. You can't blame this entirely on sugar because then sugar has stayed very stable on its consumption for the last 50 years with men and both women. So this is the result of more healthy polyunsaturated fats. And Dr. Chris Kenobi has done some incredibly great research that goes through and illustrates these 
alterations in the American diet and the cause and effect. So what are omega-6s and what are omega-3s? Okay, these are essential fatty acids. We have to get these from our diet. Our body does not synthesize these in, in any way. And they're essential for our cellular operations. So you have, you have oxidative omega-6 fatty acids and you have antioxidative omega-3 fatty acids. And there are eight predominant omega-6 acids and there are eight predominant omega-3 essential fatty acids. So we're gonna talk about these. And so here's where the dilemma comes in. The same metabolic pathways handle both omega-6s and omega-3s. And so what happens is if our diet is balanced, we have a balance of omega-3s and a balance of omega-6s going into the system. We do not have a sorting capability. And so your desaturate uh, six, your desaturase five, and your desaturase four enzymes are the ones that handle the different groups of omega-6 and omega-3, but it's the same pathway for both. So what happens is it's the dietary ratio that determines what ends up into your cell. And so if they're balanced, we have one and one going in. If they're imbalanced, we have an excess. And currently the U.S. diet is at a minimum of 20 to 25 omega-6s to one omega-3. So that's way more oxidative capacity than there is antioxidative capacity. And again, your EPAs and your arachidonic acid, that's all sorted by diet. The EPA is your neurotransmission, and that is your cellular signaling. And that is massive in our metabolic system. Then you go into your desaturase 4 enzymes and you've got your DHA, which is your neuron and nerve structure. And so these are essential acids because these metabolic systems rely on these to function. And so we need this balanced ratio of one to one yet we're consuming a ratio of in excess of 25 to one. So there's massive oxidization. We've always heard that inflammation is the cause of all disease. Well, inflammation is created by your immune system as a response for healing. And so oxidation occurs before inflammation. Prior to 1850, Omega-6 comprised 1% to 2% of the human fat tissue. Now we're at least 20 to 30% of the human fat tissue. And this is from seed oils, trans fats, and hydrogenated vegetable oils. And we talked about this. 43% obesity, 72% of the population is considered overweight. By 2030, at least 50% of the population will be obese. So historically... We've had a very healthy, balanced omega-6. Today, our shift is in, uh, into a very, very imbalanced high omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. We just don't have the oxidants to deal with, the antioxidants to deal with the oxidants. And so as you have, your, your, your system requires a balance. As you move away from this balance and you increase the oxidization and the inflammatory response, you have perpetually increasing metabolic disorders. So your cells have to have oxidization. It's a critical part of cellular respiration. You have to create heat and you have to release energy. So you have the need for oxidization. And so in a balanced form, it's absolutely essential and critical. But this is how we're treating our metabolic system today with excessive omega-6s. Everything is inflamed. Everything is on fire. And Jerry Bernetti was one of the best at describing and exposing this. So this is one of my favorite little videos. This is your mitochondria constructed with excessive omega-6 essential fatty acids. These oxidative acids have no capacity 
to remain stable in your cellular membranes and your mitochondrial membranes, they're breaking down and oxidizing and causing this cellular dysfunction. And so the purpose of this presentation is to talk about the kinds of meat that we eat, the concept of health, and where the healthy life-generating energy and fats come from. Our program requires no vaccines, no antibiotics, no hormones, no grains or seed oils ever. And especially, especially we want to stay away from the vaccines that are coming, the mRNA vaccines that are happening in hogs. They've been going on since 2018. It's coming into cattle. It's already in chickens. We do not want these things in our food. Historically, we have been raising grass-fed animals. That's how everything was raised for millenniums. We've switched into feedlot grain-fed. And so this is where we've introduced the wrong types of feed to animals that we consume. And so here's the problem for consumers is everything is marketed in meat with an identity label. This is organic. This is natural. This is Angus. This is grass fed. And the problem is it doesn't tell you what the components are. Everything is, is identity labeled and it's not substance labeled. So when you go to the store, how do you know even what you're buying? What is even in that meat? What has it been fed? What are the components? We have no idea. And so you have these categories of grass fed, feedlot fed, and now there's an omega balanced natural meat, and they all have very different capabilities. Historically, grass-fed is considered healthy. It's non-GMO, and they try to restrict the use of antibiotics and hormones, and it's historically had a very healthy ratio <clears throat> of omega-6 to omega-3 just because it was fed grasses. It didn't grade very high. It was standard or select, and they were older animals, so they were tougher. Well, the feedlot came into play with antibiotic uh, coming into the system in the mid 18 or 1940s. And so they could crowd the animals, put them in high concentration feeding operations. And by feeding them corn and soy and other grains, they could fatten the animals, which was actually a market demand. They wanted better flavor, better tasting, um, a little bit more tender meat. It accomplished that, but in the process of switching the feed, it brought a lot of toxicity into the meat. Well, our system is natural grasses and all natural forages, no antibiotics, no hormones, no vaccines of any kind. All of our products can be considered organic, and we have exceptional, exceptional omega-6s to omega-3 ratios, and we'll get more into that as we go along. The only problem is, is it has very limited availability because this is, an, this is a new approach to growing meat. Feedlot beef is very unhealthy. We are going and have been testing meat for a lot of years, and we're testing on the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. 97% of the beef in your grocery stores are feedlot beef. This particular animal was almost 11 to 1, and so that's that's too much oxidation and too much inflammation. And so you go through the different qualities of grass-fed and feedlot and omega balance. And so let's look at where the problem is, is dominantly being generated from. You have the genetically engineered feeds that come into your feedlot operations. You have your drug toxicities. So constant antibiotics, vaccines, and then you have chemical toxicities from the forages that they're fed of herbicides, fungicides, insecticides. And then there's a whole series of metabolic toxins that oxidize from omega-6s. And we're going to talk more about those very specifically. But these are after oxidation and inflammation, they turn into cellular poisons. In the omega balanced natural beef, we have an exceptional essential fatty acid ratio of one to one. We have great flavor. We're very tender because we can produce an animal in one third of the time of grass fed and one half the time of feedlot fed.
And we're doing it on grasses and natural forages. And again, we're all considered organic. So in your peroxidation of omega-6s, you have them as they break down into different cellular toxins. And so you have 4-hydroxynonanol, malondialdehyde. You have oxidized linolytic acid metabolites, acrolein, carboxyethylpyrrol. And so there's a whole series of these cyto cytotoxic, genotoxic, mutagenic, carcinogenic, atherogenic, thrombogenic, obesogenic, and pterogenic things. And right here on this slide, it gives you an exact breakdown of which of these metabolic poisons are mutagenic, carcinogenic, obesogenic. And you can go through down through here and see what they're affecting from the arteries to the blood, to the fetus, to the DNA damage, and, and the fatty plaque in the arteries. We just have far too much oxidation and we have too little antioxidation in our food. And so when you look at this, where's this coming from? Okay, it's coming from seed oils. And so when you look at soybean oil, it's almost 10 to 1. Palm oil, over 40 to 1. Cotton seed, over 110. And you come up to safflower at almost 150 omega-6s to 1 omega-3. These are massive, massive overloads of oxidization. And we are genetically and metabolically not designed to handle this. And so it isn't just the presence of omega-6s that's there. The additional complication is what happens in the oxidization potential. And so what you have is even though soybean oil is very low in omega-6s compared to some of the other oils, it has a much higher oxidation potential. So this is very damaging. And so... Here's the main culprit. Largest selling drugs in the world are statin drugs because they're attacking cholesterol. And so this is where we dispel the cholesterol myth is LDL is a low density lipoprotein and it is a protein that carries cholesterol. It is not cholesterol. It's nothing more than a shuttle. Seed oils increase the susceptibility of LDL oxidization. And as you go in here, the oxidized LDL is strongly tied to metabolic syndrome. And so you can go through these different researchers and what they're finding is cholesterol has nothing to do with heart disease except if it is oxidized. And we see that the concentration of low density lipoprotein, cholesterol in the blood has virtually no relationship or development to atherosclerosis. So as we continue through here, it's over and over and over. When cholesterol is bound to saturated fat, it does not readily oxidize. Cholesterol is protected from oxidization by saturated fats. And furthermore, it is the oxidation of LDL is initiated by the oxidation of, li of linoleic acid, your omega-6 contained in the LDL particle, okay? That's the culprit right here. And you can go on and on through these research reports that describe the abundance of, of oxidization and the foundation is your omega-6 essential fatty acids. In the bloodstream, when this oxidization occurs, the myocytes gobble up the inflammation, the excess oxidized omega-6s, and they take them into the cell wall. And these were where the macrophages begin to accumulate. And these are how your foam cells form. This is your plaque in your arteries. It's not coming from cholesterol. It is coming from oxidized omega-6s. And so as we continue through here, now we're coming into our meat research, all right? So this is the work that we've done. We started this in 2007, and we have done an endless array of tests. And so how does our meat compare to other meat? So our Omega Balance Natural Beef, this one is 
one of our T-bone steaks from one of our animals. This is this will grade prime coming off of grass and legumes. You have a grass-fed steak here at 1.34, and then you have Wagyu at 6.63. This is your grass-fed steak. It is honestly grass-fed. This is a New York cut, cost $25 a pound from a regional grocery store, and it is 1.34. It's grass-fed. This is Wagyu. It's a ribeye. It's graded prime, cost $35 a pound. And it has an omega-6 to omega-3 ratio of 6.63 to 1. And so when you start looking at how does this accumulate in animals? So we've taken uh, grain. And Ken, I just want to interrupt for one second. Yes. So I mean, again, you've been using this term um, for your, for your um, proposed label, but you haven't explained what it is that is how you're doing it. I think that's the... The point we want to make sure people get to here. You've got a, a a a sort of a name for what you're doing, but you aren't you aren't explaining to the producers, you know, what you're doing on principle. Okay. So what we're doing is we're following the pattern of grass-fed beef, which is is natural forages. Ruminants are designed to eat grasses and forages. That's all. That rumen is emphatically not designed to eat grains of any kind because it upsets the volatile fatty acid balance within the ruminal system. And so when you look at properly feeding an animal, you have to stay within the laws of nature. You can't jump the fans and have nature protect you. In fact, what you, happens when you jump the fence and you start feeding animals things they're not designed to eat, it creates a toxicity. And that's what we have in our poultry, our hog and our beef industries. Yeah. And now even in our fish industries, Dan. And so we're staying with grass and how we're accomplishing that faster growth and faster energy release is we go through a organic biological fermentation process. So we we have a proprietary blend of microorganisms. We use a proprietary blend of minerals and, and food sources. And so we're taking the grasses and we're simply putting them up as high moisture. And we're using that, the, the biology base that should be in the gut as a pre-digestive organism system to break the grass down and make it more digestible. Grass fed is a very slow process because the, the rate of release and the digestibility in your hemicellulose, cellulose, and lignin is very low. And so the older and the more the grass grows, the, the more indigestible and tougher it gets. Well, we're taking those young grasses and we're fermenting them. We biologically break them down so that the animal isn't requiring 15 pounds of grass to put on one pound of gain, we can be in that six to one range or lower, depending on the quality of our fermentation and the quality of our feed. Right. So, <clears throat> I think, I mean, as many of those details as you want to get to, I think that's really where the majority of our producers are. Yeah. And, and, and you know, listeners are, are curious. So okay. the, 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 the brilliant biochemistry background about human health and disease is, is, you know, uh, boy, if it's not categorical, <laughs> I don't know what could be, but yeah, please, it, as, much, as many of the details of what you've been doing as possible, that would be the, yeah. So this is, so we're just jumping off, off of the, the human health into the meat side. And so everything that we eat is a reflection of what it eats. You are what you eat eats in a, in another way. So how do we get elevated omega-6s in animals? We just have to look at their food sources. So when you look at corn, it can be as high as 25 to 35 to one, three. You look at wheat and barley, you know, they're in the 15 to one range, peas. Now you look at pasture grasses at nearly five to one flax at nearly four to one and alfalfa at two to one. You can see that there's a lot of different variation in, in things that are fed animals. 
And so, again, you look at what our feed options are and what you feed your animal, it will be what you're eating. And that determines your metabolic health. So here's a conglomeration of an incredibly long history of work and research and testing. So I want to explain this. And this is, again, coming back to you can tell what the animal's diet is based upon the meat, the milk, or the egg. And, and so this shows up, and this is how we test for it. So this is a pork chop from a national, excuse me, a national grocery store. And so you can tell it's fed corn predominantly because it is almost a 29 omega-6 to 1 omega-3 ratio. This is, the next one is internet beef. Now, these people tout that they have the highest grade and the finest beef in the world, and they sell it. This particular steak costs $154 a pound, and they sell it like it's the most expensive beef in the world. And what I'm telling you, it is incredibly toxic beef because this has a predominantly almost all corn diet. You look at this one, this is another internet beef cell, and this is a this is one that everybody's heard of, 20 and a half to one. Again, predominantly corn and some grain. This one at 7.4 is grass-fed corn finished. This is New Zealand lamb that is grass-fed and grain finished. And you can tell the grain will elevate the omega-6s. Now, it's been predominantly grass-fed and later grain finished. So you can see the decline in omega-6s, but this is still excessive. This will cause disease. Organic chicken. Now, a lot of people think because I'm eating organic, I'm eating healthy. Well, you may have avoided the toxins and some of the agricultural chemicals, but you're not avoiding the cellular poisons and the cellular damage that come from high omega-6s because there's a lot of these poultry operations that feed organic corn, organic soy. Well, you still are, you still have the high omega-6s. This is generic chicken. Again, they're fed grain. They'll be even higher. And it's just a matter of what combination of grains they're fed. Generic eggs at 14 and a half to one. Here's grain-fed bison at 21 to 1. It has to be predominantly corn-fed. Now, here's bison off of another farm that was grain-fed with alfalfa, with hay, into a pellet. Well, you can tell that from here at 3.6 to 1 that the diet is predominantly hay with a little bit of grain. Now, honestly, grass-fed you're going to stay under that two and a half to one ratio pretty much all the way through. It is a very healthy ratio. The problem, the complaints tend to be is it's a little tough because it's older and it doesn't have flavor because it's missing the fat. And so what we have tried to accomplish through our fermentation program is that we accelerate the energy that can be released from the feed so we grow our animals. And so under optimal conditions, we can produce a slaughter weight animal in about <clears throat> 12 to 14 months. And where we have winters and we have seasonal things, typically we'll be around that 15 to 16 month range and a lot of our meat will grade choice and prime. One of the differences is how, how early that we kill it. But our, our beef consistently will grade so close to that one-to-one -one ratio. Our bison is typically right on that one-to-one -one ratio. And our lamb that we did was right on that one-to-one -one ratio. And so you can see that through the biological fermentation that we use, we have, we have incredible growing times, we have very tender meat and we have excellent, excellent flavor. And so as, as we get more into this, 
and we we talk about this, this neurological degeneration is now happening on both ends of life. And this is another incredibly important component because it isn't just omega-6 versus just omega-3s. There are very specific categories of where these omegas play incredibly critical roles in our metabolic health. And so right now, it is less than one in 36 children is autistic. And it is now less than one in 44 adults in America are autistic. ADHD, nearly 10% of our children and almost 5% of our adults. Alzheimer's disease, 6.7 million Americans over 65 have Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Again, another 6.7 million Americans and expected to double in the next 30 years. And so this track we're on is literally an extinction for the human family. This food system has to change. And so when you look at what these vital components of these omega-3s are, is it's incredibly important that we look at how we get these into our diet. And so with a newborn, you have this brain development is rapidly, rapidly occurring. I mean, why do we have such a massive rate of, of, of autism in our children? This, this never happened before. Is it, it was incredibly rare. This is commonplace now. In some places, it's as low as 1 to 20 or even less. And so as these brains develop, the components of these brains need to be there. Breast milk is loaded with omega-3s only if the mother has an omega-3 fatty acid intake. And that there is in the dilemma. Not only do we have agricultural chemicals like glyphosate, and neonicotinoid insecticides and other things that are neurologically and, and uh, endocrine system damaging is the very fundamental components of these essential three fatty acids are not in our diet. So I want to talk about this. The EPA okay, is absolutely crucial for neurotransmission. It reduces inflammation at the nerve terminals and helps repair damage to the neuronal membranes caused by fructose. You have your ALAs, your alpha linoleic, linolenic acid is an antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and it affords cardiovascular protection. And so your DHA, your docosahexaenoic acid, is essential for neuronal structure and neuron and your cell membrane stability, and especially in your main cell and in your mitochondria cell membranes. And so what's critical here for your, for your brain development and for continued brain health is that you have these omega-3s, EPAs, and DHAs in your diet and where do they come from how do we get them and so your white matter of your brain okay this is your brain's communication network okay this is supported heavily by docosahexaenoic acid dha your gray matter right this governs the intelligent thought this is your neurotransmission this is supported by epa your eicosapentaenoic acid, which is typically seafood-based. It's algae and phytoplankton, and we'll go into that. And so when you start looking at the research that we've been doing with eggs, all right, so in 2021, we began testing commercial eggs. And so you have eggs... The average person in the United States eats 284 point something eggs a day. And so that's a huge part of the diet. Well, when you have chickens that are fed corn or 
grains, you're going to have high omega-6 eggs. Those are highly inflammatory, highly oxidative. And so the research that we've been doing is on doing different blends of grain, but also in doing sprouting. And so we're taking the grains and we're sprouting them and we're monitoring how fast we reduce the omega-6s down to a balance of omega-3s and using a sprout or a live plant as a food source versus a grain. Now, here's the point. You can take grains and balance the omega-6s in an egg. We've done that. <clears throat> we have a grain blend that measures 1.34 omega-6s to 1 omega-3, and we can produce an egg that measures 1.32 to 1 omega-3 on a balanced side. So we can produce the non-inflammatory eggs. But as Jerry Bernetti always talked about, you have, with grains, you have the enzyme inhibitors, and you also have the phytic acid, which ties up minerals in the digestive system. And so even though grains will work, it's not the optimal food source for poultry and hogs, because even though they have a different digestive system, grains still present a problem. Grains still present a problem to us. When we eat grains that aren't sprouted, we haven't released the enzyme inhibitors. We haven't released or reduced the phytic acid. And so you still have those digestive issues. And more and more and more people are becoming grain, gluten, flour, wheat sensitive so that they can't eat those things. So here's some more interesting work that we have come up with. Just by taking our grains that we can balance the egg with, we'll take the omega-6s at just over 1,400 to our omega-3s at just over 1,000. And that gives us our ratio of that 1.34. And predominantly, it's all linolenic acid. It's all ALA. That's the major three component in that diet. However, when we give it to that grain to our chickens and we use our, our fermentive probiotic in their water and we use our mineral blend in their feed, what we're doing now is we're starting to see the DPA show up. We're starting to see decosahexanoic acid show up at just over 200. And the, the EPA, ecosapentanoic acid, show up at about 60. And so all of a sudden, we're beginning to create omega threes in the DPA, EPA, and DHA categories. So our chickens are now becoming, our eggs are now converting more of these essential nutrients that we need for our neurological systems. Now, it's not as good as salmon, all right? And so this is why it's important that we have a really good source of wild salmon. So what we've done is we've taken wild salmon and we've compared it to farm-raised salmon. And wild salmon, this one has a omega-6 to omega-3 ratio of 1 omega-6 to 15 omega-3s. Okay. And so what we did is we put it on this one-to-one -one scale. Well, farm-raised has a ratio of one-to-one. -one, and so a person may say, well, it's a balanced ratio. But the benefit of salmon is getting your EPAs and your DHAs, not more ALAs. ALAs come from grains. They come from plants. And that's why they're so predominant in our meats is because our animals are all foragers. They're grazers. And so your omega-3s that are so critical, your EPA and DHA, have typically been ocean food-based, algae and phytoplankton-based food chain organisms. And that is critical for our neurological systems. So 
The problem with farm raised is you get very little EPA and DHA and you get all ALAs, which you're naturally going to get from the, gra the grasses and the forages anyway. And so it doesn't do you any good on the farm raised side. In addition to that, you have all the genetic engineering, you have the antibiotics, you have everything that they put into those fish cage systems. All right, Ken, I'm going to interrupt one more, one more time. Yeah. We've got 10 minutes till you're done with your presentation, and then we'll engage conversation. So as much as you can share about how you've been doing it. Okay. This is brilliant, 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 brilliant. And you are totally Jerry's channel because Jerry always spoke about two octaves above everybody else. <laughs> so you're doing that again today. <laughs> okay. And so the next two slides are simply the comparison of, of what you don't want and exactly what you do want. And so as we go back into this and we, we, we go back in, let me just come back up to these charts right here. Okay. All right. This is probably the best summation I can share on how you accomplish this type of meat and an end product that is incredibly healthy, it has incredible flavor, and it has wonderful economics to the producer. Because we're just taking what nature naturally does and we're enhancing it through the activity of microorganisms and we're using the correct biology to do all of this, whether it's the aerobic biology in the soil to grow these plants and the mineral nutrition that needs to go from the soil into the plant so that it's an incredibly healthy forage. So as the plant accumulates these nutrients, it's there for when we begin to break down that plant and allow it to become that digestive energy that now builds cells, that now allows cells to replicate and function with a much greater efficiency. And so it's fermentation that we do all this with. And so you can take a grain and make it a much better feed source by sprouting it, and then even a better feed source by fermenting it. And so we're doing a tremendous amount of research right now, and we and it's not conclusive, but we have some really exciting results. Some of those I've already shared with Dan, but we're taking the grains that would not be suitable for livestock, any livestock, and we're able to sprout them in a certain way and a certain time so that those omega-6s go out of the plant they're phosphate-based oils, they're consumed in energy, and they're converted. And so we can take something that is 15 omega-6s down to one omega-6 so that it's balanced with the threes. That becomes an ideal food source. And what happens is now, because we're not taxing the immune system of the pig or the chicken or the cow, we're not diverting energy. And we have a much more digestible feed. The whole beautiful part of grasses are as, as they grow and accumulate the nutrition is that they release in the animal. We're just accelerating that natural releasing process by pre-digesting and fermenting before it reaches the animals. And this is not new. Fermentation is as old as 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 mankind, before we had refrigeration, before we even had electricity, everything was preserved through fermentation. I don't know why we're not using it like, like the ancients used this. I mean, this is just divine brilliance that is put into these microorganisms for all the metabolites and the nutrition that they produce. And so when we combine that with good feeds and the right types of of forages, uh, everything starts from a seed, but it doesn't have to be fed as a seed. And so as we understand the, the transition from seed to plant and when we harvest and how we ferment, you'll see the response in your animal because you can take identical feed off a grass-fed animal and give it, go through the proper 
biological anaerobic fermentation program with the right minerals, the right nutrients, and you can take that feed from a 15 to one that's not very digestible into a five to one or even lower. And so you're not having the massive amount of feed volume, you're, you're doubling or tripling your revenue in the same period of time. And you're creating, most of all, you're creating an end product that isn't going to kill your neighbor or your kids. And, and that's what's the most important thing is, is what are you producing to put into the food supply? And how do we educate people of what's healthy and what's beneficial in the food supply? It just goes back to understanding what the food sources are. And so that's the research that, that Jerry started. That's the research that we're continuing. And, and we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for Jerry because he was the first one that gave me this broad spectrum exposure to this concept. And as you get looking at it, this is the basis of all metabolic disease and degeneration is we've now crippled our cells. We've damaged our mitochondria. We can't even burn the glucose or the fats that we take in. Everything else is just an expression of that. And what we all don't realize is as these animals are metabolically unhealthy, us eating the same things, we become metabolically unhealthy. And so there's, there's things to avoid in our diets and there's things that we need to incorporate into our diets. There's a whole world of, of keto and carnivore and people out there and simply going to the grocery store and buying grocery store meat doesn't get them out of that oxidative inflammatory and that disease cycle. It may reduce it somewhat, but it's still a cellular toxin. And we think that the omega-6 and the omega-3s are the predominant problems of oxidation, which they are. But as they break down, they now become cellular poisons. And that's what you have to eliminate. And you just look at your food, you look at your grains, you look at how it's grown. And it's just a world of, of brilliance in creation. And that divine intelligence is if we eat the right things and we grow them the right way, that really is the fountain of youth and the fountain of intelligence is our food. And so when Hippocrates talked about this, it says, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. He was exactly right. This is where our DNA, our genetics and our metabolic intelligence all merge. And it has to be driven by food, not by pharma, not by drugs, not by stimulants. Those are all destructive and they'll lead to degenerate problems. And so this is the work that we're carrying on. And so now we're going heavy into poultry. We're going heavy into hogs and we do have the grains. We do have a lot, a lot of research on the depletion of omega-6s and balancing with omega-3s in the seeds. Again, we're not gonna feed seeds, we're gonna feed sprouted seeds and plants. And we're going to ferment those and we'll bring the poultry, the chickens, the turkeys, and with the eggs into that one-to-one -one ratio. We'll bring pork into that one-to-one -one ratio. You can do this. You just can't feed them the wrong things. So, Dan, how do we do on time? You're two minutes early. <laughs> Ken, brilliant, brilliant, um, you know, <clears throat> overview of the situation. Do you mind um, stopping your, your screen share? And I want to introduce John. There we go. John, do you mind turning your camera on? I'm trying to turn it on and I can't turn it on. It says my host uh, has yes. disabled my camera. Shauna, can you help with that? 
Um, yeah, well, there, there we, we go. go. Brilliant. There we go. So, Great. Yeah, you're a a snap addition to the to the panel this week. Some people have been asking, like, what's the whole agenda of every week of the next 14 weeks going to be? We're like, we're in the flow. So <laughs> take it as you will. You, I think, were with Joel Salton this weekend, and you were asking about these questions of Mega 6 and Mega 3 because of your uh, complete career at NIH, which you've recently retired from or many years at NIH. Um, you know, I was, I had asked, that you speak to the human health implications of all this. And you reached out to me because you said that if we could be able to monitor, measure uh, omega-6, omega-3 ratios in food, that would have a massive impact on, on human health. And I think Ken has just categorically laid out the argument in a, I mean, he's an agronomist theoretically, but what was that? <laughs> that was that was a that was a, a, a very deep you know, overview of the literature. Um, so I would invite you to just give us a minute and a half or two about your background and then sure, and well, engage with Ken. Um, and I'll put my camera off because I would like to hear you guys go for 10 minutes on some of these things, if I may. So first, let me just say thanks. Um, it's quite remarkable that I got to, invited to this today. Uh, that was one of the most remarkable lectures I've ever heard. Uh, it's a wonderful review of biochemistry for, for me. I'm a physician. I'm not a, a chemist or a, a researcher by nature. I got interested in this because I worked with homeless guys in the street and was really interested in how nutrition affected their brain and health. And so my background is an, as an MD. I got a master's in public health at Johns Hopkins, and I studied what was uh, called clinical preventive medicine, which is how to keep people healthy. And back in the day, um, we didn't have integrated medicine or holistic medicine. We just, that's what we had. And that's what I was fascinated by. The problem is what we've learned in the last 20 years has added so much to that base of knowledge that uh, uh, we've really leaped heads and shoulders above where we were 30, 40 years ago when I was a uh, graduate um, from medical school. And fortunately, I was able to spend about 20 years at the National Institutes of Health and Neuroscience studying alcoholism. And it turns out that the alcohol um, sufferers in America, we think of as alcohol use disorder, have actually a neurological disease, not a psychiatric disease, in my opinion. And it's related to their diet, which makes it much more difficult for their brains to work efficiently. Um, so um, do you want me to just go in to start off where I see what this brilliant lecture yes. has tied into neuroscience? Please. Sure. So um, just... To give you an understanding, omega sixes are the foods, uh, the food for storage. They're they're in seeds. Uh, this long lasting energy supply, whereas omega threes are not. They're more flexible uh, fats, and they originate in plants and in the ocean uh, algae. Uh, they're concentrated in uh, fish that eat those plants, and then the bigger fish get more and more. So we see highest levels of omega three in the uh, deep sea ocean fish. And over the last uh, 50 years, we've been able to study the effect of, of omega-3s on health by looking at omega-3s uh, in, in fish, because fish are basically the only source of omega-3 in our diet today. And there's so much information now that it, it, it blows your mind about how critical this omega-6, omega-3 ratio is. Um, it turns out that it might just not be the, the fact that the, these fats only uh, are affecting the composition of our our cells, but they also drive the microbiome um, that is responsible for, for so much of our disease. And the interaction between the microbiome and our gut wall is critical. And that's all dependent on the omega-3 content of our food. Um, I studied the brain at the, the NIH, and we measured actually uh, the DHA, the omega-3 uh, that's predominant in the brain. Um, and we saw that it was uh, much reduced in people with alcoholism. So when they stopped drinking, their brains would uh, take up more of this DHA. And in fact, if, if somebody is in alcohol uh, uh, recovery, if they stop drinking for six weeks, their brain regrows by about 2% in volume. That's wow. a huge growth. And that allows them to have more insight to say, hey, you know, I'm, I should stop drinking. I should um, be more aware of my problem. 
And that's really the key to recovery in many ways. We have medicines also, naltrexone and other medicines that, that can block craving, but it's the, it's the nutritional comp component of the gut, uh, especially the omega-3s that reduce the inflammation. And when we have too much inflammation in our bloodstream, it turns off the new nerve growth that's so critical for learning, for developing new, new, um, new ideas. One of the things that's fascinating about omega-3s in our diet is that they really allow more white matter connectivity. And what that does is it allows you to, to, to have a greater emotional control. And, and we'll see that in some of the epidemiological studies. Um, this omega-3s also affect the immune system, which drives a lot of our emotions. Uh, it drives all of the signaling that occurs in every cell of our body. Um, but I think probably most of us really want to understand how important this is for, for civilization. Well, um, you can look at it from the molecular level, uh, which is where you start. And it shows that uh, when you have a high omega-3 diet, as you would have if you eat only grass-fed animals and you've done that your whole life, um, or if you eat a high omega-6 diet, which is essentially the typical American um, diet that's based on corn and soy and and peanut and that that uh, omega six fats, um, which has sort of overwhelmed our our diets. One of the graphs that was shown uh, is one that we use in in our presentations to illustrate how much omega six has changed over the last century, and it's a real big effect on the brain. So when you change your diet, it's important to recognize that the half life of omega six and omega three in the brain. It's about two and a half years. That's a long time to be affecting change. So it takes a long time for your brain to recover, your immune system to recover from a lifetime of eating omega-6. In my patients, I'll give them a high dose omega-3 uh, fish oil, which is the most uh, concentrated natural form of, of, um, of uh, omega-3. And they will oftentimes recover from whatever mental illness they have. It's remarkable. Um, it's... it's one of the most amazing things that I've I've found in in medicine, and it's not just a little bit; it's a high dose, completely changes uh, their uh, prognosis for these mental illnesses, tra traumas to their brain, alcoholism, and so forth. And a lot of this may be through the immune system; it may be through the microbiome changing, so there's less inflammatory uh, leakage from the gut, so you have this less leaky gut, and that affects all kinds of uh, metabolic problems, diabetes, heart disease, as well as uh, stroke, Alzheimer's, arthritis. Um, and what we found is that is you need a high dose of omega-3s to, to cure all, all some of these disorders. In arthritis, for instance, people take, uh, have taken cod liver oil for arthritis for centuries, but you need a high dose. The low dose doesn't work. So um, getting back to what really matters. So if if we if you look at epidemiological studies, you get a kind of a picture about what the power of changing our diet back to this more original, um, even amount of omega three and omega six in our diet. Um, so we again we use fish consumption as a surrogate marker for how much omega three is in in the body, and we can see that the amount of fish is proportional to um, improved health in all kinds of areas: heart disease, stroke suicide, violence, hostility, um, postpartum depression, depression, bipolar disorder, hostility. So for my children, uh, the children are probably the most important resource we have. And we know that if the mothers eat lots of fish, regardless of whether there's some toxic minerals in these fish, the children come out healthier emotionally. If, if a mother doesn't eat fish compared to a mother that, that eats Lots of fish, huge difference in, in the emotional component, uh, the emotional ability of the children to adapt to the environment, to be social, um, to less have less conduct disorder, um, and less uh, attention deficit disorder. But again, this is a, a long-term effect. This is a, this is the effect on the human body over um, a decade, uh, be, and that's reflected because of the importance of the uh, omega threes. So that's um, uh, just a brief summary of why I think it's really wonderful what you guys are doing. And you reached out to me because you said that if there was some ability to test omega-3, omega-6 in food and give people that capacity, that could powerfully change the world, which is a conversation we won't engage 
right here, right now, but maybe soon. Um, I think the point is that with Ken's work, we can get those effects nutritionally of deep sea fish from beef and chicken and pork and eggs and milk. And I mean, and lower cost of production. So, I mean, you do the basic obvious common sense thought if you're a farmer and you're selling grain at, you know, $5 a bushel or $10 a bushel, which call it 50 pounds and you're buying back processed, you know, crushed extruded material at $25 per 50 pounds. Um, you just lost <laughs> a lot of money. And if you take that whole grain and you sprout it, um, and it goes from eight to one or six to one or 10 to one to one to one or 1.5 to one, and you work with microbes and the chickens eat that or the, or the pigs eat that, um, then actually your cost of production is lower because actual grain is a big part of your cost of production. And, you know, look at with fermented fodder for cows or for pigs or chickens also, um, the less gut dysbiosis they have, the rap more rapid their weight gain. So pound for pound, they're growing faster of, of food, but also that food is much less expensive. Um, and so biologically, you as a farmer are able to accomplish a better economic income, you know, reward. That, that, that's, that's foundational in this whole thing is if you work in harmony with nature, God, science, universe, love, call it what you will, the more you're in harmony with that, um, the more well things work. And so that's the opportunity that we're, we're you know, um, hoping to curate through this next 14 weeks. Um, the reason I had Ken on at the beginning here before we got into the deep theory and strategy of it all was because anybody in the Northern Hemisphere who's got baby chicks or, or, or you know, um, you know, you got it, you got a few piglets coming in. Um, the more rapidly you engage this understanding, I propose the better the quality of your product will be by the end of this summer, fall, which at which point we may be able to actually test these things um, and the better your economic incentive is. So yes, broad principles of, of human health and epidemiology and all those kinds of things. But foundationally, I like to think of our community as primarily producers and those who are aligned with smallholder, you know, perspective. So, um, I mean, Erwin is here still. I, I'm not sure what happened to Adrian, but um, Erwin, you're a producer from uh, the Netherlands, and I'm not sure how much you do with animals. Do you have any any comments you'd like to share? Or, um, yeah, I, I don't have any animals, uh, Dan. So. Yeah. Um, but I'm really interested. Yeah, well, I have five chickens in my garden, but that's it. <laughs> um, I'm really interested about this process of sprouting the grains and also about uh, fermenting the silage. Is it like, um, or the grasses, is it like a silage that you make, uh, Ken? It is. The grasses, the forages are all cut and harvested at high moisture, and it, it, like a normal silaging operation. But part of the critical process is, is you have the right microorganisms that ferment and break down and biologically transfer the nutrition. And so as part of the biological complex that we use, we have specific microbes that are there to do almost nothing but digest toxins. And so this is a critical component of fermentation and feed, especially in today's environment. Because where don't you have uh, insecticides, neonicotinoid type products? Where don't you have fungicides? Where aren't they using herbicides and glyphosate? And so these things are almost ubiquitous everywhere and they end up in the food chain. Well, we have microorganisms that completely remediate those. And, and we have done this work 10 years ago in colony collapse disorder with honeybees, where we would actually use a, a type of probiotic, which had your lactobacillus, your bifidiobacterium and other groups that 
were a complex of microbes with an assortment of minerals that completely stopped colony collapse disorder. And the interesting thing was, is when the honey from those bees was tested by a nas two national food companies, uh, it was tested as the highest quality and the purest honey. Now, it wasn't that the bees weren't out collecting nectar and pollen from, from chemical-free plants. There's almost nowhere you can go to do that, especially in commercial growing operations. So the glyphosate was there, the neonicotinoids were there, but in fermentation, the microbes within our blend dismantled those components. So they went back into elemental things rather than compounds, and they didn't show up in the tests. And so in our fermentation, someone says, well, my, my neighbor sprays glyphosate. I have drift from dicamba. I have all types of environmental toxins that come into play. Through fermentation, we have biology that remediates those. So then it isn't a, a negative immune system, endocrine system barrier when the animal eats it. At, or, or, and then when we eat the animal, when we eat the egg or the beef, Erwin, I mean, that fermentation is, is a wonderful addition to sprouting or just cutting forages at high moisture and re making that fibrous material much more available for the animal in digestibility and growth. And, and can you do it with uh, when you don't have access to your specific specific mineral uh, and micro blends? Can you do it with if like you don't EM have or something or what? What can you do? If yes. you don't have the right microbes, they're not going to remediate glyphosate or your neonicotinoids. So the question is, how do we get what you have framed so far as a proprietary blend? What are the insights you want to share? Um, the principles. I think you've covered a lot of the principles already. Maybe what's the cost of being part of what you are doing right now? I mean, the, the fact is that Ken has been doing brilliant work for a long time on his own dime and is working with growers on significant scale with a completely marginal profit margin. Can I say that, Ken? I mean, you were doing brilliant work and yes, you have a company and, you know, yes, we all have to, to balance those boundaries, but I think at least the concept of what you've conveyed is exquisitely important. And that's why I've invited you to be here as the first presentation after me, um, because just of logistics of the growing season for anybody in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, but how much are you willing to share? I mean, we, we've discussed this. Obviously, it's work you've done privately and, um, and you are wanting to take it to a, a global level and you're not attached, I don't think, to your label, but you obviously have something of value, which is part of what we'll be talking about next week with game theory. How yes. do we how do we empower all those who have you know created value to have value in the in the global web, but not have to be um engaging in the conventional um framework? So no, great question, Dan. And so, as Dan mentioned, we have privately funded all of our own research, and it's allowed us to stay completely independent of other influences, because all we were after was what's happening and what's the truth. And so oftentimes when you have money and donors, they have a specific agenda. And when we started this, we just wanted to find out well, what's happening and what's good and what's bad. And so once we've established this, we haven't tested a lot of other products because there's so many variabilities in the tests that we've done just with ours. And so anyone is free to reinvent the wheel and follow the pattern and try this on their own. We've been at this 18 years and put a tremendous amount of money and time and resources into this. And so if someone would rather not reinvent the wheel, we invite them to work with us. And what we're saying is, is we can support your operation 
uh, especially with ruminant animals. We have so much data on those and we're rapidly accumulating the data on poultry and hogs is that you can springboard off of what we're doing, but our expansion costs are going to be way beyond our potential revenue from the product sales because the products aren't expensive. And so right now we're setting up a model to say, okay, if you use our platform and you work off of that, you work off of the products that we have that we know that will produce these results, we're simply going to ask for a very, very small royalty off of what you produce. So like, for example, we'll take a beef producer and take him from a, a conventional system into a grass fed or an omega balanced natural system where his animal is just in the market, just because of the grass fed market is now worth three times what he would get out of the, the commodity market. And so we say, okay, if you're going to produce this animal, you can start immediately. You don't have to do any long-term research. We have all the data. If you just follow these steps, you'll end up at the same place we have for the last 18 years. And that changes his revenue stream dramatically. And we say, okay, for example, on an animal, if you want to participate, at least allocate us $100 per head. You may be making two to $3,000 per head, but you have to share some of the gain back with us or we're unable to logistically support the demand. We're going to have to build millions of dollars worth of additional warehousing space and a whole set of infrastructure. And we can't do it on making 50 cents a gallon on the fermentation cultures. We can't make it by making 20 cents a pound on mineral. You can't do it. You just can't support that. And so our background is biological, natural, organic agriculture. So we deal with soil minerals and a lot of crop nutrition all across the country into Canada, Mexico, South America, Guatemala, and, and elsewhere. And the revenues from that business is what sustains all this research, but we're going to be quickly expanding past the our ability to self-fund all of the extensions. So like with poultry, we'll sit down with a producer and say, okay, on your scale, can you pay so many cents an egg? Can you pay so much cents per chicken? Can you pay so much per hog? Can you pay so much for your cattle? because it puts them in a massively higher revenue stream and but we have to expand to support that. So that's how that's how the model we're looking at doing is you're welcome to do it yourself, but if you want to save time and get right into business, then you have to participate with us a little bit so we can expand and support you. And this is what we're discussing right now, um, which I think is massively, relevant obviously um john you've listened to the q a for the last 15 minutes we will go to the the everyone else in the around the world with their questions but any any closing comments or thoughts and your video is not on nope John, can you uh, commute? No. All right. Well, um... <laughs> I think you've just laid out at the beginning of this conference, Ken, something that is um, more deeply what's coming to bear at the end of the beef project um, and everything that here we all has done in France, and Blue Blancour, and a bunch of other things, which is why John reached out to me. Um, we don't have to have the best meter for everything, but if we actually had 
the ability to monitor omega-6, omega-3 ratios, that would be massive in the market. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> I wish John could unmute and turn his camera back on. I think he has something to say, but he's not there yet. So either of you, Ken, you want to give us a summation of your broader thoughts and implications here? This is your presentation, and it's been brilliant. Sure. Is the whole foundation for doing all of this is changing human health. The, the track that we're on is we are so metabolically unhealthy that we're not creating a future generation of thinkers and workers and moms and dads and people who engage with the intelligence of nature that connects that divine creation with our creation. And, and we just seem how to separate ourselves from this whole process of being human. And everything has become so specialized, we don't see the big picture. And, and I think for people to thrive and survive in the, the coming years with all the pressure that is being put on agriculture, all of the pressure on food that, and, and the intensity of the barrage of the media from pharmaceuticals is these are not solutions. These are dependencies. These are treatments of symptoms without resolving the underlying problems. And they're incredibly profitable but it leads to degeneration of humankind. It leads to the degeneration of all of our livestock species and our plant species. And, and, and I just look at the big picture of this is we've got to have something better going forward to create a better world for those who need and will come after us. And you, you cannot do that by ignoring the divine intelligence that's put into creation, that's put into every form of life, including us. And when we don't understand that, and we don't appreciate it, and we tend to abuse it in all the areas that we do, the consequence is our health, it's our intellect, it's our vitality, and it's our children. And so this is about cleaning up the food supply. This is about understanding just basically the right and wrong ways of doing things. And these industries have been built so thoroughly and so pervasively on monopolies and, and patents and design that it's it does nothing but generate revenue and create control. And these are not healthy processes. They're not healthy products for the human family. And so we have to get back that caring about what we do, what we contribute to the human family, what we contribute to nature and what it can teach us. Then we actually participate in life instead of just simply trying to take from it. And and I think that's a critical part is that we understand with a consciousness what we're doing and why we do it, because that then connects us to the creator. And that's why we're here is we're here to learn. We're here to understand. And this is an incredible opportunity. And so I just look at it as we need to have that spiritual connection not only to our life, but all life around us. We need to have that knowledge and that reverence because all of this is incredibly meaningful and we will not protect our generation and the future generation absent this connectivity or this consciousness and this design to fix our health and fix our food systems and fix our planet. Brilliant. I, uh, I nominate you as a one of our one of our um, <clears throat> pastors <laughs> the next twenty years. 
That was brilliant. That was totally brilliant. Um, I really, really appreciate that. And okay, John, now you have a, you know, I said three minutes before we're at 229. So we're engaging the Q and A, but give us two or three minutes at least, John, if you would. So I, I just want you to know that that solving this problem with, with seafood, the way that, you know, God intended us um, to have a diverse uh, intake of, of food is, is difficult today. But it seems like you can put chickens anywhere on earth and having a chicken that's fed forage foods. I'm curious why we why farmers moved away from uh, fermented silage and fermented uh, foods, because that's so important for them, our human, our human health, just to have more fermented foods and, and so forth. And it's important to understand that our microbiome, what the quality of our of the microbes in our in our gut is so important for our mental health. We're just beginning to understand how critical that is. And um, I think the creator designed us to be the way we are. And part of that is to have a diverse kind of, uh, of diet. Um, I was really encouraged to hear that the microbiomes can break down glyphosate. That's great. Um, and uh, I, I think this is uh, important to understand to protect the mental health of our children um, going forward. Um, and um, I really believe that the change in the diet that women can eat that has higher omega-3 versus omega-6 will make a huge difference in the ability of our of our civilization going forward to, to be more resilient against diseases, against psychological stresses, and uh, to make a better community for us all. I couldn't agree more. In fact, when you look at the human genetics, John, we have somewhere between 20 and 22,000 genes, depending on whose argument you want to listen to. But then you take and you look at your microbiome. For every one cell in our body, we have 10 microorganisms on us or in us. And so when you look at, you start looking at the microbial genes versus our genes. Well, if we have 20,000 genes, our microbes, just if we had roughly 10,000 species, we have over 8 million microbial genes. So that's a ratio of approximately 364 microbial genes to one of ours. So really who's switching who and who on and off? You're exactly right, John. It's just a brilliant point that your microorganisms are that intelligent factor in that communication system between your gut and your brain. There's, there's no greater connection. And then reality is probably your microbiome is running most of your brain. And you know, exactly. so with... no, what I want to say is I just had two old white men call out God. I just want to say that was what the essence of what you both said was is a divine order and intelligence and consciousness that we're all serving. Um, and now we're, you have 28 minutes to answer um, 32 open questions. Um, shall we start? We have, this is the next phase of the conversation. Um, Mandy asks, can we get a copy of the slides? Uh, Ken, I'm sure you would be happy to Alive those with the recording. Anybody who gets can have. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Chris, life expectancy pre-1850, 60s compared with today. Okay. 10 seconds or, or less. Okay, I'll answer that. 1850s, four out of 10 children died. Life expectancy for adults was still in the 80s and 90s. When you take out childhood mortality, life expectancy is still relatively the same on the end. Yeah. So it, it's the childhood mortality that, that skewed that. Okay. Um, Pre-1500, I would understand that you're, you know, positing a biblical framework on this conversation. So we can just expect that what you're saying pre-1850 is, is back a ways. And not engage that right now? Yeah. 
All right. Um, sunflower olive olive oil as uh, not a seed oil, correct? It's it's a it's a tree. It's an olive oil, and it but it's very stable. It's very non oxidative. So then, like an animal fat, olive oil is very much, very much. Yep. A lot of data that shows that um, the more olive oil people have, the longer they live or the healthier they are. So there's there's some different omegas. There's like an omega nine uh, and other fats in the olive yep. oil that really help it to be healthy for us. Um, let me see. Do you guys have you looked at any questions you want to engage or answer? If not, I'll keep going. Okay. Where's that? Um, has this research extended beyond meat to milk and other dairy products? Yes. Um, <laughs> it's effectively applicable across the board. Is that? Uh, we've got a question about high fructose corn syrup, and and you, I think you addressed that after that question was answered. Uh, asked Ken, but the connection between sugar and omega six levels was pretty categorical in the data you presented. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure I understood the question, Dan. Um, someone was asking about not just omega six, omega three oils, but also the role of um, simple carbohydrates, white flour and sugar in people's diets. And I think you showed a graph after that question was answered that showed that the connection was not so much to simple sugars as it was to three sixes. But I'd love to hear John's comment on that. It's it's hard to know what's most important. I certainly do get effects when people stop drinking Coca-Colas, the high fructose corn syrup that's, uh, again, from a, uh, from our modern agriculture processed food is really pretty toxic to the body. You know, fructose is a, is a, nor is a healthy sugar in moderation. We get it in fruit. And the, uh, the way I understand it is that we get this fruit, this fruit sugar in the wintertime or in the fall when we need to put on weight. And so people put on weight as they have more high fructose corn syrup and they put on weight as they have more fruit. And the animals, of course, do the same. Um, the omega-6s and the omega-3, the ratio there, I think that's probably, there's more data that shows that that affects the mental illnesses and the heart disease and so forth than the, than the carbohydrates. But I, I'm not sure they've been looked at head to head. The, the one thing that on carbohydrates if you stop, they diminish out of your system very quickly. But as John pointed out, you have a half-life of two and a half years with omega-6s. And so it's much more difficult to deplete the omega-6 balance in your cells and tissue than it is simple carbohydrates. Those leave very quickly. All right. So I've got two good questions here um, from Sue. There was also a mention of fermenting cut forage. Is this the same as silage? If not, what is different? A, and are these microbes within the proprietary blend, natural, from real from nature, or man-made microbes from a lab? How much do you want to go into this? Okay. So again, you're looking at the type of forages that you do. There's corn silage that people do. There's haylage where they do alfalfa. There's also grasses, chopped barley, chopped wheat, those kind of things. They all are forages that can be fermented. Now, what you look at is what's the content? What's the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio of, of a mature corn plant when you would cut it and chop it? Well, you've got the plant and you've got the grain. And so you aren't able to ferment out a lot of the omega-6s, uh, some, but not all of them. And so you want to look at the plant. That's why we threw in the slide when we showed what just grass 
at nearly five omega threes to one omega six. I mean, that's a wonderful, wonderful fermentation product. And it isn't, and it isn't in any way against the nature of the cow to eat it. Now, eating a corn plant, tremendously, tremendously more cellulose and lignin in a corn plant, much less digestible and a lot higher omega-6s. So it wouldn't be as an ideal food. Alfalfa, fermented alfalfa works great. Fermented barley, chopped barley, another great forage as long as you harvest it right. And we're also doing a great deal of research and testing on the natural cycle of omega-6 from seed to, to seedling germination into plant growth during vegetation, then into reproductive stages. Because what we do know is a wheat seed starts at 15 omega-6s to one omega-3. But by the time it grows, it now has an abundance of threes to its omega-6s. But at the end of its life, when it's putting back seed, it's now reaccumulating the omega-6s to put back into the seed. And so it's not just it's not just the right plant, it's harvesting at the right time. And we've got a whole bunch of incredibly fun research coming out on that. So we optimize this feed for our animals and it's doing so, the right plant. Again, a question from Sue um, from Africa. We have a number of small farmers from Africa present at this presentation. So just so you know, um, and she's been critical in getting a lot of them to be present. Often farmers in Kenya are encouraged to produce hydroponic feed for cattle in dry areas by sprouting barley. Could we please hear a little more about the fermentation process, please? And barley is eight to one and, you know, wheat is where, and okay. I mean, let's imagine you have small farmers in Africa because you do listening to you right now okay. and we'll this recording afterwards. And as much as you can share about these numbers and, and what can be done, we're working for a global audience. Okay, terrific. So uh, I failed to answer one previous question. All of our microorganisms are natural. They are completely non-genetically engineered in every way. And so the product that we use that way is certified organic. So back into your sprouting, your hydroponic systems, is you start with a a uh, wheat or a barley seed at approximately 15 omega-6s to one omega-3. Your seed runs out of seed energy to continue growing that plant at about six to seven days. And so we've, taste, we've taken that stage of growth and we've tested the omega-6s and we've dropped them from six, 15 in a seed to roughly seven to eight in a seven to eight inch tall fodder plant. Now, just feeding that is going to still end up giving you a high omega ratio in the meat, even for your cattle, uh, even though they're, they have some ability to, to hydrogenate, or hydrogelize these omega-6s, it's still too high and you'll end up with a, a four and a five and a six omega-6 to omega-3 ratio at the end. Because I've already tested this. I've taken grass-fed beef that was finished on fodder that was that was reduced to seven and eight and tested the meat in the end, and it was still four and a half and five and a half, which is much better than corn-fed, but it's not nearly as good as grass-fed, and, and it doesn't have the flavor and the tenderness of the omega-balanced meat. So we are doing a ton of research on all different kinds of seeds. And this is the other part that the diversity of feed is incredible. We all think, oh, let's sprout barley because it's it's what everybody does. But we need our animals to have a diversity of not just grasses, but also the legumes. And so there's vetch, there's clovers, there's peas, there's lentils, there's all different types of legumes that can be sprouted and they can be blended. But the other thing that we're doing is, is we're going into an organic process of assisting the wheat and the barley 
to continue to grow after the seed runs out of energy to get it down to that one-to-one -one ratio. And that's our next step. I know it can be done. I just haven't done it yet. So it's one of those intuitional things that come after 20 years of research that says, you know, this should work. And so as soon as we have that, we'll share it with you because, because the barley and the wheat and that will only get halfway there. We can, with organic nutrition, organic foliars, we can finish that. And that's exciting. And you've been doing work with producers of grain to help them produce grain that has lower cost of production and higher nutrient value. They can feed their own animals on their own farm, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, Sue, another question. What about developing countries where producers cannot afford the costs but should be producing this way? I don't think you answered the question of how low your margin is and what the ingredients are. Let's accept that you have a company. And the way we do this with the BFA is not to be, you know, emphasis, emphasizing companies, but sharing, you know, critical insights. You've told me how many how many quarts of liquid per ton of grain are needed for a chicken and how much that costs and what your margin is. I mean, just let's share with people. Yes, you've got a company and you're proposing a, a label and you have to protect your your science. But I mean, you've been sharing very deeply, very generously for a long time. And I think that's important that people have that context. So... Okay, so like just in poultry, you know, we have to take this in steps. So we have approximately a million chickens in Montana that we we provide a poultry probiotic and then a mineral base to. And so, for example, is we use one quart of the poultry probiotics, which costs the producer approximately $2. And then we use one pound of mineral, which costs the producer uh, about 50 cents. Per ton of grain. Per right? ton of feed. And yeah. what happens is, is the producer will save between approximately 15 to 20% on his feed budget. So if you're if you're just a natural, non-organic producer, you're going to be roughly $350 to $400 into your feed per ton. If we say 15% of that, that's a minimum of $60. Just there. So it's cost him two and a half, and he's going to save approximately 60 just on his feed. The next thing is, is the egg quality dramatically increases in shell strength, in the yolk thickness and coloring, and also the white or albium thickness. And so you have medium eggs going to large, large going to extra large. And you know those processes are incredibly profitable to the growers. Besides that, we have a product that we grow here that has been through two cycles of avian influenza. And we have not had one barn or poultry operation break with avian influenza through both cycles in 2015 and 2021 or 22. We, we just don't have it. Again, because it's, it's the gut microflora that drives this. And we also put in, and we make this culture in a certain way, so that it has the bacteriocins that we don't have E. coli, we don't have salmonella. And that's hugely important in the egg industry. So we're protective against these environmental pathogens, whether it's avian influenza, whether it's E. coli, salmonella. We grow these cultures in a specific way, but it's very inexpensive to, to the producer. And a lot of these farms that we have are realizing what costs them two or three dollars to get in turn saves them hundreds of dollars and increase or makes them more money in profit. We also are extending the bird's longevity. And so typically in a large poultry operation, 30, 40,000 birds 
even in these organic operations, they'll go 65 to 70 weeks before they're replaced. We have flocks that have gone 100 weeks still in the mid 80 to high 80% production. And that means that instead of replacing three flocks, they're only replacing two flocks. Well, to replace a flock, it's gonna cost you just under $100,000 and you're gonna be five months without revenue. So you figure what that cost is and, and our farms don't have that. We don't have the death loss. We don't have the sickness and disease. And that's only with grain. With that's still grain fed. Yeah. Not with complete decrease of cost of production because the grain was whole and then sprouted, right? Yeah. Right. So the opportunity here, I mean, protein is a big market on the planet. And the more developing world's countries have access to money, the more they spend on protein. And the more they're experiencing uh, first world health implications. So, I mean, I, I see this opportunity global to help farmers make a better living and um, produce food that's more nutri nutritious. So, I just lost John. I was wondering what Urban had to say, if anything at all. If not, you can. Oh, John's yeah, a moment. <laughs> I just went home. You're, you're fine. Uh, yeah, I, I was in the field earlier and um, I was getting uh, ditches because we had uh, four inches of rain yesterday. And uh, in this carrot field, is is horrible. It's all flooded. But. Um, uh, it's done for today. <laughs> so I just, uh, Ken, it was a remarkable presentation and uh, really blew my mind about the omega-3, especially in kids, how important it is. And uh, it's really uh, uh, great um, that you have this system now, which you can use your normal feed and upgrade it so that it produces uh, an animal product with a very good omega-3 to omega-6 ratio. I think that should be distributed worldwide, so to say. We hope. That's why we're doing this presentation, to engage the global community yeah. and share as much as possible openly. John, you haven't spoken for a while. Are you able to plug back in or not? No. All right. Have either of you... Um, can our, uh, Erwin see any questions do you think you want to engage oh. with the community? Let's see. There's John. Yeah. While they're looking, John, what do you have to say? I think you're muted. You're still muted. There's a, a question about uh, the impact of grow, growing use of palm oil having yep. been looked at versus as a newer or vegetable oil. A again, the, the new trend in palm oil is to go genetically engineered through, through synthetic fermentation to create palm oil. That is an endless loop of toxicity and problems because you know, in a cell is you have an influx of nutrition and you have a detoxification and an exhaust or an outlet for the toxicity. In a biological fermentation system, in a synthetic, uh, genetically engineered fermentation system, you have no outlet for the toxic metabolic products that occur in that system. And so how do you separate that out? One is the genetically altered microorganisms. You can't possibly contain and, and know and control all the metabolites that come from that. And you have no toxic remediation from that process. And so creating, whether it's palm oil or other oils, which are underway through this process, 
is an even more toxic process than the palm oil itself. But palm oil is extremely high in omega-6 oils, and it really has no place in a metabolically healthy system. It, none, none whatsoever. There isn't a cell structure. There isn't a genetic intelligence that functions on that type of fuel. All right, and John, will you stay with a question or two or not? So I'm having all the technical difficulties here. Uh, be glad to answer a question. I think there was one question about my, you know, what I what dose of a omega three or what form I I would give a patient. So again, um, it's the old fashioned uh, cod liver oil that we've had for a couple of a couple of centuries that that. Um, at um, a couple of tablespoons like the old folks used to take for arthritis seems to make a big difference. But that's not available everywhere. And in fact, it's become more and more expensive as people have overfished. So what works probably just as well is to have a diet that's rich in little fish. So one of the projects that I have in uh, in Kenya, uh, in uh, Kiberia, which is one of the slums in Nairobi, is to do a uh, uh, a project where we're giving the alcohol treatment, the traditional spiritual, psychological, and uh, medical uh, against craving, but we're also giving food. We're giving fermented foods like uh, their fermented milk drink and also um, fish, uh, dried sardines, which uh, adds a great intense um, dose of omega-3s to help people. In response, John, uh, Ken, sorry. Oh, no, he's, he's, that's brilliant on the use of omega-3s to rehabilitate the neurological system. I mean, that's, it's foundational. I mean, that's, that's the first time I really heard a medical professional address it. I mean, holy cow, John, this is fantastic. <laughs> I mean, everybody else wants to do a psychiatric intervention with, with drugs. And it's like, no, no, no. John's dead on the right track here. Of, of I don't think he told us what his background was. I'm not sure he needs to right now. But he has 30 plus years NIH and governmental agencies. So, yes. I mean. So, I, so just to tell you, I, I, I've helped develop uh, drugs for alcoholism. But. Once I got out and started treating patients more, it really made sense to to really understand the problem more holistically. All doctors that see patients in the ER kind of recognize that if somebody has brain atrophy on a CT scan, they probably have alcoholism. And it's completely ignored in terms of what to do for the patient, which is why I think alcoholism is a neurological disease more than a psychiatric issue, because you've got to re restore the brain. It's amazing how the brain uh, is designed to regrow if people just start eating healthy and stop drinking so much. Which is basically the point, is that if we change our diets, then we'll become more whole beings, which is the whole in objective of the BFA, is to increase quality of the food supply. And I mean, you just read that to me recently, John, but you said if we could shift omega-3, omega-6 ratios, in the American diet or global diet, that could have powerful positive impacts. And what I understand Ken is doing is, you know, trailblazing a path where that can be done by anybody globally whose profits are remarkably low. But the next week of this conference will be game theory. How do we take what we know and our partners and our allies and our understanding, just the whole, our whole beings, and engage that in a process that can facilitate the outcomes we know we want to see. Because it's not that we don't know what needs to happen. It's just how do we take that understanding and implement it globally? And um, yeah, I'm totally honored to be hosting this event. <laughs> with such amazing beings. Um, and we're only two weeks in, so.
get ready yeah. for the next 14. One, yeah. one comment, there was a really good question. It says, how does this affect acreage? Because almost everywhere land prices have gotten astronomical. And so, but by fermenting the proper way, yeah. you're actually reducing the need for acreage. Yes. Massively. And then the other thing is, is as you look into the sprouting systems, you can grow in a 8,000 square foot building, the equivalent yeah. of almost 200 acres of ground. And so there's a combination of, of fodder and, and grasses and yes. forages that you can massively increase your production. You can increase your herd size and reduce expenses and not have to expand because we're creating the efficiencies of all this. That's the opportunity. It's been a great two hours. I hope people enjoyed themselves. And um, yeah, <laughs> get ready for the next 14 weeks. That's all I can say. Yes. And if people have questions, they're welcome to email me and we'll try to answer the questions the best we can. Thank you so much, Ken. And I just want to reaffirm the honoring of Jerry. Um, Somebody who was totally brilliant, who passed too early, but has um, brought forth brilliant insight, who's affected us both powerfully. So. Amen to that. Yeah. Be well.